So the iPhone 12. This is a phone I reviewed nearly eight months ago and it's been available to purchase for nearly nine months. And for the first time on the channel, I wanted to revisit an Apple product many months down the line to reassess my initial statements. Now, as an Android user, it's always gonna be hard to review an iPhone without being biased. And so I always try and keep that in mind whenever I review an Apple product. And in fact, I've been quite positive in all of the iPhone reviews that I've done so far. But when I first reviewed this phone, there were a few key comments that I made that I wanted to readdress in a new video. I wanted to see whether my thoughts had changed and ultimately, given all that's been released in the Android world so far this year and with the pending announcement and release of the next iPhone lineup on the horizon, whether I think this is still a phone worth getting. So with that said, here is my review of the iPhone 12, nine months later. Okay, the first thing that I wanted to address was the lack of a fast refresh rate display on, well, any of the iPhone 12 lineup. Now the inside word was that with the inclusion of 5G for the first time, Apple was concerned with the battery life the phones would have if they also had fast refresh rate displays. And as we all know from that initial announcement, they decided that they would have a much easier time promoting 5G to the masses rather than a faster refresh rate display, which from a business standpoint, I kind of get the logic. But here's the thing, I don't know where you live in the world and whether 5G is a bigger thing for you, but here in Australia, or at least where I live in Australia, I have not once been able to utilize 5G, either on the iPhone 12 or any of my Android phones for that matter. So of course for me, I'd much rather they went with the faster refresh rate display on this phone instead of 5G, but I also know that they would have been grilled had they omitted 5G. So what do you do? But on top of that, when you look at the Android side of things and what's been released so far this year, it is very hard to find a phone that's over $400 that has been released without at least a 90 hertz panel. And pretty much all, no, scratch that, all Android flagships now have fast refresh rate displays. Now, the rumors do suggest that we will finally see 120 hertz panels on the next iPhone lineup, but then that begs the question, where does that leave the iPhone 12? Well, look, Luckily, the display on the iPhone 12 is still fantastic, but more importantly, thanks to the software and Apple's incredible optimization with that A14 chip inside, the difference between the iPhone 12's 60 hertz panel and an Android phone's 120 hertz panel is not as great as it is between an Android phone's 60 hertz panel and an Android phone's 120 hertz panel. Something to keep in mind. But regardless, the lack of a faster refresh rate display does make the iPhone 12 lineup feel outdated. And this will only be further emphasized if and when the next lineup does include those rumored faster refresh rate panels. Now, just quickly touching on the design of this phone, and back in my first review, I complained that the regular 12 models had this glossy finish on the back. And I said that I vastly preferred the frosted finish found on the Pro models. Now, I still agree with that sentiment, but a lot of people commented on that video saying something along the lines of, who cares about frosted versus glossy? I'm just gonna be using it in a case anyway. And you know what? I actually agree with those comments. And in fact, for the most part, I've actually been using the iPhone 12 in a case myself. And it's actually a case from channel sponsor, Rhino Shield. In fact, Rhino Shield sent me a few options for the iPhone 12, but my favorite has to be this sleek and minimal black case that has this beautiful customized gold lettering down the bottom. They have a bunch of other customizations you can make on their website as well, including their Mod and X system, which allows you to switch up backplates, rim colors, or even the colors of the buttons. Now, as well as that, their cases come in a huge variety of finishes and styles, and on top of their amazing in-house designs, they've actually also done a bunch of big name collaborations as well, including with PewDiePie, NASA, League of Legends, plus a bunch more, all of which are available for the entire iPhone lineup. Beyond that, the protection you get from using a Rhino Shield case is top shelf. And if you buy one of their impact screen protectors to go with, I mean, you're pretty much set. Their cases are available for a huge collection of phones and they come with a lifetime warranty. And Rhino Shield also offers free worldwide shipping for qualified orders. Now, because they're sponsoring this video, Rhino Shield are actually offering 20% off their cases for the next week if you use the code SAM12 at checkout. Or if you're watching this video after that time period, then you can still get a handy 10% off. So make sure you check out all of their amazing cases and consider picking one up for your own phone using the first link down in the description below. 
Now, before we chat about software, which is where I'll spend most of my time for this video, I just wanted to take a quick fire look at a few of the other comments I made in my initial review. Firstly, MagSafe. I kind of bagged on it in that first review, and guess what? I haven't touched the MagSafe charger since making that video. Look, some people will dig it, and that's fine, but I don't. I still think it's a gimmick. Secondly, battery life. And I wholeheartedly stand by what I said in that first review. The battery life in this phone is fantastic. You should really never need to plug it in more than once a day unless you're doing some really intensive tasks, but otherwise, thumbs up for the battery in this phone. Thirdly, the cameras. And I still think the iPhone is top of the pack by far when it comes to video, particularly for that selfie camera, which is kinda next leg. And that's not even considering all of that Dolby Vision goodness that is also available for video. Even without that, the video quality is amazing. Images on the regular 12 are very pleasing as well, but I will say, for the most part, it's not nearly top of the pack when looking at the competition. And in fact, it might not even be in the top five. Android phones have come such a long way in the past few years, and I actually think that the way Apple processes its images leaves a bit to be desired for the average user. Photos are always quite warm and a bit flat as well, and whilst the photography aficionados out there might love the extra flexibility when it comes to editing these shots, I'd say that the average user will actually prefer the images that come out of phones like the Pixel lineup or the Samsung Galaxy flagships, particularly when it comes to images of people. And then finally, performance. And suffice it to say, this thing is still blazingly fast. And that's probably one of the biggest selling points for iPhones and why they have such good resale value. People know that the performance, even from three to four year old iPhones, is probably gonna stack up and feel just fine against today's standards. And whilst nine months really isn't that long of a time period to measure this, either way, this phone is still beautifully fast. Okay, so then we come to the software, and this is without a doubt the biggest aspect that prevented me from switching to the iPhone 12 full time. Now, whilst Android has copied many, many things from iOS and vice versa, what iOS has just never quite sorted out in comparison is firstly, the customization of the home screen, and secondly, the notification system. So customization, whilst you do get some minor level of customization in iOS now, thanks to the introduction of widgets in iOS 14, the widgets themselves are still really limited. In fact, I would say the biggest issue is that whilst the widgets might look really nice and have solid uniformity to them, unlike Android, the functionality of iOS widgets is still so limited. For example, in the Android world, since the introduction of full screen gestures, it's actually become harder to customize your phone like what we used to be able to do with third party launches because either the animations become all janky or the gestures just get disabled altogether. But despite that, thanks to really two main features, you can still create beautiful home screen setups even with the system launcher. Now the first feature is that Android lets you place widgets wherever you want them on the home screen, right at the top, down the bottom, just to one side, no problem. iOS, well, for some reason, they still don't let you have negative space at the top of the home screen, meaning unless you use some sort of workaround like the Clear Spaces app, your icons and widgets always have to live at the top of the screen, which is actually kind of annoying for one-handed use. But then the second feature Android has over iOS is not really a feature so much, it's actually a third-party application called KWGT. Now for all the iPhone users out there, KWGT is essentially a full-blown custom widget maker. And this app, along with the thousands of supported widget packs you can find on the Play Store, is what allows for all of these really unique and creative looking home screens that just aren't otherwise possible for the average user to create. In fact, in my recent review of the Xiaomi Mi 11, which has quite a restricted system launcher as far as Android launches go, I was able to use KWGT to create an entire home screen setup that looked a lot different from the stock layout. And this is only possible because Android lets us have widgets with essentially unlimited touch points. On iOS, you can really only touch an entire widget to launch into whatever shortcut you have set up. But on Android, I can set up all of these little app icons within the one widget and each of them launch into different shortcuts. But what's also great is that KWGT itself just costs, I don't know, $8. And at most you're paying three to $4 for the expensive widget packs on the Google Play Store. Most of them are actually free. Whereas on iOS, you'd be lucky to find icon packs or third party widget packs that don't cost at least $10 alone. And even then, most of the good ones you have to pay a monthly subscription fee for, which is kind of ridiculous. Okay, so I know most people don't really care about customization, so 
I'll leave it at that. But as mentioned, I also really don't like iOS's notification system, particularly in comparison to Android. Honestly think they only need to copy one thing from Android to make me like it. Notification icons in the status bar. Without these, I found that whenever I used the iPhone 12, I was always missing or forgetting about notifications. And this has been one of the hardest things to get used to when switching over to iOS. And I think a lot of Android users would say the same thing. Okay, so where does that leave us? Well, at the end of my first review, I said that the iPhone 12 was a worthwhile upgrade over the previous year's iPhone 11, pretty much thanks exclusively to the OLED display. But right now, halfway through 2021, it's actually a slightly different story. With the release of the next lineup mere months away, unless you've just dropped your phone and it's shattered, or for some other reason it's inoperable, I would actually suggest holding off from buying the iPhone 12 or any of the 12 lineup for that matter. I think it's really worth waiting to see what we get with the next iPhone lineup and then also assessing what happens to the pricing of both lineups once they're announced. Fingers crossed the next lineup launches at the exact same pricing structure to what the iPhone 12 lineup launched at, or even better yet, a little cheaper. But then as a result, hopefully we see the current iPhone 12 lineup getting a nice little price decrease, at which point I'd say this phone becomes once again, a really viable option. That said, for the Android users out there, I don't know. I probably wouldn't recommend making the switch unless you're someone who's played both sides and switching back wouldn't be an issue for you. But if you're someone who's used Android consistently for the last several years, then I say stick to Android, at least for the time being. Let me know your thoughts on the matter down in the comments. And don't forget to check out the incredible Rhino Shield cases using the first link down in the description below and use the code SAM12 at checkout to get 20% off your order for the next week or 10% after that. Aside from that, hopefully you enjoyed the video. Thank you all very much for watching and I will catch you later.